Hello, everyone, and welcome to our next IPW session titled Discipline Self-Service BI Enables Advanced Analytics, which will be presented by Marius Moscovici, the CEO of Metric Insights. All audience members are muted during the session, so please submit your questions in the Q&A window on the right of the screen. Our speaker will respond to as many questions as possible at the end of the talk. Uh, that Q&A will be hosted by Natalie, who you also see on your screen. Uh, please note that there will there's a linked form at the bottom of the page titled EDW Contact Session Survey. This is where you can submit session feedback and we encourage you to do so. So let's begin our presentation now. Thank you and welcome, Marius. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, and uh, uh, welcome to our presentation. Uh, today, I hope to be able to go through self-service and what, what's involved in really making it successful, and, and hopefully leave you with some specific uh, examples and tips and ideas that you can implement within your environment, irrespective of what technologies or, or processes you choose to use. Uh, so let's start with talking about what self-service is. And obviously, kind of in intuitively, right, in the enterprise, you've achieved self-service if you as a consumer of information can get to that information without having an intermediary in, in, in between you and the information. Uh, but that really breaks out into two different definitions depending upon who you are within the organization. So for the analyst, self-service is about data. Right? It's about how do I get to data that I can trust and be able to generate analysis that is, that is correct and accurate that can be shared out with the business. But for consumers of the information, for the business users, it's really about insights. It's about how do I find the answer to my question uh, in such a way that I can you know, find the right dashboard, find the right, right report, get my, my question answered, and not have to go and bother an analyst to be able to, to, to go dig and figure this out for me. So that, it's important to think about the fact that it, there are these different constituencies, and for each of them, self-service means something very different. So let's break that down a little further. If you think about your business users and the challenges that they have with self-service, the biggest issue they typically have is the fact that they're overwhelmed by a whole slew of irrelevant dashboards and reports. Right? If you go in, inside of almost any mature BI environment, there are lots of reports, multiple BI tools, uh, and then even within a given BI tool, there are often two or three or four versions of something. Once, some things are obsolete, some things are current, some things have correct business definitions, some do not. And it's a huge, huge challenge for the casual consumer of information, somebody who just wants to spend a minute or two and quickly get that answer, to be able to figure out, well, what is the thing I should be looking at? And they look through bookmarks, they look through emails. It's, it's, it, 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 there are huge barriers to self-service in the enterprise. And then if you flip to the other side of the coin and you look at the analysts, they have two challenges. First, they're spending a lot of their time oftentimes answering questions from the business users who are just you know, frustrated, don't want to uh, try to figure out information and you'll just find it easier to just send an email or pick up the phone and ask a question about how to do things. But then also on their own, for the analysts, the analysts that are doing analysis to find that, to find answers, they need to be able to figure out, well, what is the data that they can trust? Which data set do I use? Is this, does it contain the right data? Is the data current? Do I have the right information to be able to pull, in for, to pull uh, this data out correctly with the right logic? And so these challenges are there for both consumers and producers. And we've come up with a general governance life cycle that I want to share with you that we found to be very effective at serving both of these constituencies. But first, I want you to consider the fact that when we think about building content in business intelligence, we're, we're using a very limited paradigm. Typically, we're using kind of the builder's paradigm of, you know, let me figure out what needs to be created, let me design that, let me go ahead and implement. And that makes sense in the context of a specific report or dashboard that needs to be built. But it doesn't really work in context of the overall overarching ecosystem that represents your BI infrastructure. Because there, it's much more of a garden, 
right? It's much more of, a, of an ecosystem with different plants, different, different species, all coexisting together. And you need a solution that addresses the fact that there's a continuous motion required to refresh and revive that ecosystem so that it's relevant to your audience. So let's talk about what that means. So first, Everything starts with understanding usage. So none of us start with a blank slate, right? There's content already out there. So as you think about enabling self-service, the first place to start is to say, well, what content is being used from the various touch points that are out there? Understand that. Then use that information to then build and deploy new content that fills critical gaps. Once you've done that, now go ahead and measure the engagement. So it's not enough to put something out there, I built it, great, now move on to something else. The key is to say, well, how is this, how, what kind of engagement do I have with this content that was created? How does that engagement change over time? Is there sustained engagement or is it a blip where people look at something and say, oh, this is new and interesting, but once I've looked at it, I'm moving on to something else. Then you need to, based on that information, that needs to inform a whole process by which you promote and purge content. So take and, and say, if you've got poor engagement, but you believe that this is actually something useful, go ahead and promote it. If not, if there's something sustained poor engagement, even after it's been promoted, they may perhaps have missed the mark. Either it needs to be modified or it should be purged so that the space can be decluttered and, and all of the content that's relevant is being shown. And then you use all this information, that content optimization cycle, to then optimize the resource allocation. And, and resources are both things that you are, the licenses, right? So if you've got, uh, if you're spending hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars on your licensing, take a look and say, well, where are those licenses being used? Who are you using them? And, and making sure that those are allocated in a way that's based on usage, that's, that's rational, that optimizes those resources, the key part of the process. And then having that information, the, the content optimization process, feed into the way the teams get managed. So your most valuable resource, of course, is your BI team. And so you need to make sure that that team is aligned in such a way that they're building content that is effective, that is useful to people, that creates sustained usage for, the, for your community, not one-time blips, and then people forget about it, it becomes part of the clutter of the environment. And so following this continuous improvement process, this almost infinite sort of cycle, and, and having a rigorous process by which that happens would, uh, is what would enable a, a, tr a true self-service environment. And let's talk about, a little bit further about that. So, you know, there's that expression that, you know, ferns can't grow in the desert. And that, that's obviously true. And because, you know, a fern requires the proper context to grow, it needs the right climate, it needs the proper amount of water. And, you know, that's not present in the desert. And the same is true for self-service infrastructure. There are some things that have to be in place for that to thrive. And those are, there needs to be easy and very rapid consumption of content. So a user should be able to say, you know, quickly find that content they're looking at, whether they're an analyst looking for data or the business user looking for a particular analytic. They need to know that they can trust that particular piece of content. I cannot self-service if I'm looking at a visualization, but I have no idea if that is really the visualization that I can trust that has correct data or if it has some other business terminology or definition that's not correct. And similarly, as an analyst, I, I'm not going to be able to go ahead and build a new analytic off of a table unless I know that that is data that I, that I can trust that has the proper definitions. And then that really translates into correct context. So understanding this data, what are the definitions that come into it? What, how does the data get in there? What is all the contextual information that gives me the comfort that it is accurate and trustworthy and, and timely? And then therefore I can, I can, on my own, make the right decisions with the data. So all of this has to be in place for an effective self-service infrastructure. And so kind of to look at some examples of that, right? When I, as a consumer of information, when I come in, I need to have a portal, a single place where I'm gonna have all my content. And this is critical. If I have to go one place to go to my R Shiny applications, another place for Tableau, another place for MicroStrategy, each of them with their own sort of organizational structure and search algorithms and, and ways to find the data, you've already lost me from a self-service perspective. Right? I need to remember what kind of report it is, I need to know where to look, and I need to remember all these different paradigms for finding things. These to all be in one place, all tagged and organized and searchable in one coherent organizational pair. 
It also needs to be possible for me as a user to come in and go from a low fidelity to a higher fidelity view in a progressive manner. So having the ability to have previews is, is really important. Uh, I might have a kind of initially, I see a list of things, maybe some small number of visualizations, small thumbnails that I need to be able to quickly transition to, to be able to see a larger visualization, see contextual information that tells me, you know, if uh, who are the owners of the particular piece of content, uh, what are the, who are the data, st data steward, the, the technical owner, the business owner, if there's tagging associated with, you know, does this contain PII information, what is the data classification, all those things need to be available contextually right there for me to be able to use. That information for it to be useful needs to be published in such a way where there is governance around it and there's a proper certification workflow for it, right? So it doesn't just magically show up in the ecosystem useful. It has, you know, in order for it to be, to, to get there with the right tagging, with the right information and documentation and certification, there needs to be a process by which we can move things through the various stages to get it certified. And that, that's not a one size fits all solution. It's going to vary based on the type of content that you have. It could be as simple as an engineer creating a piece of content, publishing it, and then uh, you know, authority, a, a business stakeholder certifying that is correct. Or it could be something that is multi-stage, where you say, you know, it's going to be a, it's going to be reviewed by a data steward or a data stewardship team, and move through various stages of certification before it's published and available uh, to the business users. And and so whatever that the right process is for that particular piece of content, it needs to be followed such that then you know that it's been promoted in a way that it that supports effective discovery. And then all of that tagging and context needs to be available to the consumer of information when they're viewing a dashboard. So for example, you know, take a look at this screenshot here. I'm looking at the Tableau dashboard, but there's context wrapped around that dashboard. So up at the top, I can see that there is a, a uh, you know, that this data has actually been delayed. So then I know immediately and not to give, get the wrong idea by looking at this information and, and Jump, you know, jumping to the wrong conclusion because I'm looking at yesterday's data or last week's data. There's a delay, it's gonna get solved. I should come back and check later. Furthermore, if you look at the next line down, I can see underneath the name and description that I've got those little tags that tell me what are the KPIs? What are the, the enterprise terms that are relevant to this? And then if I click on one of those, then I can see a pop-up that gives me the context. It tells me, oh, this has enterprise churn. Well. Here's the definition of enterprise churn. Uh, it, this is all about uh, giving, you know, this is the definition and here's the business owner, here's the technical owner. And oh, below that, I can see that there are a number of other visualizations that are available that are using the same terminology. So that fosters that, that self-service because if this anal analytic doesn't have what I need, I can click on one of the other ones or go into my search and find the item that maybe does. So this kind of guided process whereby I, I wrap the particular visualization with context and as a consumer of the information, I then see that contextual data together with the, the actual visualization gives me the, 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 the comfort and the confidence to know that I can use this and make decisions on my own. From the analyst perspective, or even perhaps even from a, from a business user that is perhaps a little bit more sophisticated and, and really knows a little bit about their, their ecosystem, another key piece of context that's necessary for self-service is to understand lineage. So for a particular visualization, I'm maybe looking at this Tableau dashboard, how, what, what is the, where does the data come from? You know, where it comes from this particular Tableau data source. And where does that Tableau data source come from? You know, maybe that's coming from Snowflake tables or, uh, or some database or some CSV or some combination thereof. So understanding when I'm going to consume something, where that information comes from is incredibly useful. Because, you know, if I'm consuming data, maybe this dashboard is coming directly from Salesforce. I know that I'm looking at raw data. I'm looking at information that's being collected directly into my CRM. But if it's coming from my enterprise data warehouse, well, if it's coming from my cleansed area, then I know that there's a whole bunch of cleanup that's been done and this is data standardized and has gone through some data quality. If it's coming from some raw area of the system, then I know that perhaps it's more un unfiltered raw data. And, and that, that context will tell me how to use the information, which then enables the proper level of data discovery. 
The other aspect of self-service from an analyst perspective is that I need to be able to discover the data sets themselves. And to find a data set, it's not just about, you know, here's the name of the data, here's the columns in the data. I need to know what are the analytics that are used by that, but is it certified? Who are the owners for that data set? Who do I go to ask a question if I do need to figure out something about the data? What, for those columns, what, it, what are the, specific KPIs that those measure. So, oh, I see a column in here. This is measuring enterprise churn. I should be able to, again, go back and see that definition. Now I know from an analyst perspective that I can use this particular data set for my analysis because it has a definition that's relevant to my analysis. So all of this has to be all leveraged together and consolidated into some kind of a view that's accessible to me as an analyst so that I can use that information to make sure that a particular analytic is the one that I need. So I want you to think for a moment, and if you can go back this far to pre-pandemic times, when you might be, have been going into the office and working on perhaps you, you are someone who builds analytics uh, and reports, and, and consider for a moment that, you know, what that experience, the serendipity that would happen in our day-to-day -day experience working around the office. You know, perhaps you would go and you're working on a particular analysis, and then you'd go to take a break to get a cup of coffee and in the breakout room, uh, you'd run into Joe, another analyst. And, you know, you'd strike up a conversation and you mentioned to Joe what you're working on. And, and Joe would say, oh, you know, I, I, I was just talking to Alice the other day and she has an analysis just like this that she created last year. You might want to check with her and see if what she's created has built is actually useful to you. And, and you'd go and, you know, follow up with Alice. And sure enough, she's built something and that, that coffee break that you took saved you a day of work because you didn't have to go recreate the wheel. And not only that, but the fact that you stumbled across something that's already useful, well, that saved the end user from having two objects out there that six months from now, they have to figure out, well, which analysis do I go with, right? There isn't dupl duplication of content because of that serendipity. So one of the key things that as you build out a data discovery platform for your users, you want to think about how do you generate serendipity by design? How do you avoid the duplication of effort or content that happens so often when people build, you know, three or four similar versions of the same thing, creating a, and making it impossible for, an anal for, for anybody other than the analyst to figure out who should use a particular piece of content to get a question. And, and making sure that then the business users stumble across that content as they need to find the information. So in other words, that it's not something that, oh, I have this in some data governance tool or in some wiki page somewhere that somebody has to go look for it. But because, you know, people are in the stream of consciousness that they're going through their workflow, they're going through the day-to-day -day process of doing their work. It has to be that they find these things through that process, through that regular workflow naturally. Right? And that's, and if you can build that serendipity by design to system, then in, implicitly you are fostering a sense of, of governance and a sense of data discovery. So take a look at that as an example. You know, you need to have a, a universal search engine built or in deployed across all of your analytics. So irrespective of the type of content that the user should be looking at, there needs to be a place where they can find that content. And it needs to be more than here's a SharePoint site with a bunch of links, right? Because that's just overwhelming. I need to be able to go in and search for something and then by in the process of that search, just discover other content. You know, I, whether that, that content is things that are that are maybe tagged by the same thing. Uh, find that there's, you know, different types of objects that I have. Uh, I should be able to search by, by, by um, popularity, right? Because if there's something that's more popular, clearly that's going to provide uh, uh, potentially more useful information. So as a consumer of information, I should be able to find that. And, and, and all that needs to be available and accessible in the search paradigm that I'd be using to be able to find the information that I want um, so that I can discover content. And then furthermore, I need to be able to have a class of content available that is discoverable even if I do not have access to it. Right? If you think about the, the types of content that you might have in your enterprise, there's obviously the things that everyone, that a particular user has access to, they should just be able to find it and use it easily. Then there's the things that are highly confidential, highly restricted. You don't even want to make people know, have users necessarily know that they exist unless they're, you know, a, a privileged set of group users, you know, HR reporting on who received a bonus last quarter. Well, maybe that should just be uh, a, a visible to, and, and available, obviously, to the HR team. 
But then there's this vast set of content in between where it's not going to be open to everyone. It's going to be accessible to a specific set of people because there's security that should govern it properly. However, you want to make it discoverable you, because let's face it, when we, when we create a piece of content and we assign it to a group of users, sometimes we're not perfect about what that access control should be. Maybe there's another ancillary group of users that would be interested in it, but I'm not sure if I should give them access to it, so I don't. And then if they, those users are not aware of that and cannot discover that content, then they're going to go and ask analysts to create it. So, and then there'll be duplicative content created. So to ensure, to minimize that kind of duplicative effort and to and, and to build in serendipity into, into discovery, you should be able to create content and put it out there, make it discoverable so people can search for it. But when they look fine, when they find it, maybe they're seeing a blurry image. Maybe they're just seeing the metadata around that content. And when they click, they're saying, ah, I don't have access to it. And here's a process by which I can go and, and generate access that, that will then put it in place. So I think that's a, a you know, that's a critical part of ensuring discoverability. And finally, instrumentation is very important. So whatever you've done, whatever judgment calls you've made about, hey, here's the content that I'm going to publish, here's how I'm going to make it discoverable, the only way to know if you've been successful is if you measure your success, right? I mean, that's obvious. So you need to understand, uh, are you succeeding or not? You have to understand what is the user journey with that content? And then you need to figure out what those gaps are and fill those gaps. So what do I mean by that? Well. You need to make sure that you have some kind of way to understand first what content is useful. So in that overall garden that you've created with that whole ecosystem of visualizations, what are people looking at? What is most popular? What's increasing in popularity? What's decreasing in popularity? Right? And what's not being used at all? So that gives you kind of a snapshot of what's useful. That's, that's critical. Secondarily, it's much more important to know, obviously it's important to know it's use, something is useful, but more, more so you need to understand the usage patterns. You need to know is some visualization that was created three months ago, is it doesn't have a whole bunch of active users because people were using it a month ago, but then stopped using it. Or is this, or is this something that's really sticky? Are people coming back and using it every single day? And so this kind of a, this is an example from our application where there's a, 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 an animation and you can see the, the circles that you're seeing there are, represent the number of days since somebody's used a piece of content. And then the, this particular content that I'm, I'm looking at, I can see the users that have, have used it just a day ago and those users that have used it 30 days, 60 days, 90 days as they drift out. And then if you play that animation out, those circles move out of this from the center if the user stops using that content and they stick close to the center if the user continues to use that content with a frequency. So then you know that level of stickiness that's involved. And that's, that's, that's critical. And then finally, you know, understanding the content that's there is only part of the equation because the second part of the equation is know what's missing. So that search page that we talked about, the place that people go to find content, whether that's data from the analyst perspective or, or visualizations from the, from the user perspective, we need to be able to track what is it that people are looking for that they are not finding. You know, what, what are the unsuccessful searches? What are, because that tells you that either that, hey, maybe some things are, maybe that content's there, but I need to tag it better, I need to describe it better, I need to make it more accessible to people, or perhaps the right content is missing and this thing that people are looking for, we need to build up and that informs the proper alignment of resources in that, in that uh, organization. So let's review for a moment the pieces that we need to put in place in order to make the discovery work. And then we can go to questions. So first, we need to create a clean and engaging content space. So that's about more than just creating yet another dashboard or report to put it out there. It's about looking and carefully assessing what's there, making sure that only the things that are actually useful are, are, de are deployed, that things don't have usage or either promoted or demoted uh, if, or, or sort of removed, that there's not duplicative content out there, that it's all accessible and searchable and visible to users. Then we need to make sure that there's a certification or lineage process that where, whereby you can, as a user, when I discover content, I know what is certified, what can be trusted, and where does this data come from, and, and, and so that I have the proper context for making decisions about how to use it. 
I then need to be able to make sure that the environment balances security and discoverability. So it can't just be about locking everything up. It needs to be about, of course, completely securing your data and making sure that things that are, should not be discoverable are not, but that things that can be discoverable are enabled so the users can have those serendipitous moments where they go, oh, look at that. Somebody already created that analysis. Let me go in there and take a look at that and they'll have my answers. And then finally, there has to be a monitoring and usage analysis component that has been built in such that you can then iterate in the cycle because nobody's going to be perfect in their implement, initial implementation. You need to be able to have processes in place where every month you evaluate what's going right, what's not, and then iterate through the process. So with that, let's open up the question to q and Hi, yes, we do have a couple of questions from the audience uh, and just about five minutes left in our session. The first question is, um, is the tagging and linking of visualizations automated or does it need to be done manually in your tool? Well, that's a great question. And I just forgot to mention one thing before I answer that question. Um, if you're interested in any of these, um, uh, it, we have created a resource for you that summarizes, that uh, provides a lot of this information um, shared in here, as long as a lot of other useful information was created by the uh, the IIA, the, the uh, International Institute for Analytics. Um, and we, we collabor collaborated with them on that, and it, and it really talks about the overall framework for establishing a, a self-service program. So uh, feel free, if there's a URL there for our website, so anybody that wants to kind of just check it out um, and you know have a more material around self-service and how to achieve it within their enterprise, I invite you to go ahead and download that. Um, so going back to your question around tagging, uh, to enable discovery. There are two ways in which that can be done or, or multiple ways. Um, that information can either be inherited from the BI tool. So when, when for us, when we onboard a visualization from a, from the, for let's say from Tableau, we can bring in the tags that have been set in Tableau directly into the portal. So it's, they're available for search and inclusion. It can be set up within Metric Insights. So somebody can come in and manually set those up and, uh, and uh, uh, as, as part of the process in which that governance process in which content is onboarded. And then finally, it can also be imported from data governance tools. So if you're using say an Alation or a Calibra and you've got tagging information there for that content, uh, we have hooks that allow to, you to pull, pull, pull that information in from there and automatically apply it. So the idea is, you know, our philosophy at least is, you know, wherever it is that's most comfortable to create those tags, um, that's where you should do it and then and then pull the content in. The key is to make sure that it's accessible all the way, not just to the not just in the source system, but all the way to the at the point where an analyst is looking for that information. Thank you. We have another question. Um, if we build so much governance infrastructure for self-service, such as data set discovery, certification workflows, lineage, et cetera, is there still a need to promote the data set to a production platform managed by IT with SLAs, et cetera? Well, I, I think those are kind of, I mean, it's, it's a great question. And I think that the governance infrastructure, it's not, you know, how it gets implemented in organizations is vastly different. Oftentimes for proper governance infrastructure, there is some IT or central group that helps set the standards and processes. And then they're managed and supported by the business units uh, so that the business units are actually making the day-to-day -day decisions about what is, what is available and what is not. Um, so, so it depends. I mean, I'm not knowing much about the the particular uh, questioner's infrastructure. It's very hard to to give you something prescriptive. But I would say that both parties need to have something to play here. Both the the centralized data governance team should be establishing high level standards, and then those standards should be mindful of literacy and how to promote data literacy because governance and literacy are sort of go hand in hand. They're not they're not by themselves. And then the they have to be in partnership with the business units and the, and the folks that are actually building the analytics for the business units because none of this can be successful as, as, in a vacuum. You know, you have to have somebody who's intimately familiar with the data set that, that's creating the right tags, that's defining the lineage that's doing that. So think of the centralized team as technology enablers and then the folks close to the business, close to the creation of the visualizations, as, as the people that are really pouring in the context. And there should be a close partnership between those two to make for the, for the highest level of effectiveness. All right, I think that that just about wraps us up. So thank you, Marius, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, we do wanna just note again that there is 
the linked form at the bottom of the page where you can submit your session feedback. That's very helpful to all of us. So it'd be very great if you could do it. This wraps up our session. Everyone is encouraged to continue networking inside the Spot Me app. And don't forget to check out your sponsor section for information about the tools available to support your data management programs. Sponsors will be in their virtual exhibition booths until 1.30 p.m. Pacific. Thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you in today's other sessions. Thank you. Thank you.